Hi, I'm Susan Swain, host of C-SPAN's Q&A, where we spend an hour with nonfiction writers and historians who add context to today's news. David Ferriero is the archivist of the United States responsible for safekeeping our country's founding documents, 15 presidential libraries, and more than 13 billion pages of text and 44 million images. He's retiring this spring after more than a dozen years in office. During his tenure, Mr. Ferriero presided over the archives' digital transformation and prioritized greater public access. In recent years, he's led the archives through several high-profile legal challenges. A Vietnam veteran himself, he oversaw the archives' first ever exhibit on that divisive conflict. In this episode, David Ferriero talks about his accomplishments and challenges at the archives and the work that's ahead for his successor. David Ferriero, after more than 12 and a half years as the archivist of the United States, you've been nice enough to give us this interview on what's your very last day in this building. What are the emotions going through you right now? It's bittersweet. Um, I've enjoyed mostly my time here. It's been an extraordinary um, honor to be charged with taking care of the records of the country, to leading an agency that is focused on preserving our democracy, a a tremendous honor. And the mission of the agency in terms of making sure that the American public has access to those records to hold hold the government accountable for its actions but also to learn from our past has been um, a a mission which I have embraced from from day one. You came from, not from the federal government and not from Washington, D.C. So what are your takeaways about how this city functions? It's intense. It is within the last five years more partisan than ever. Um, It is certainly driven by both ends of the street that we're on, Pennsylvania Avenue, the White House on one end and the House on the other. And depending upon how those two ends are getting together, it affects all of us here in the city. And of course, COVID over the last two years has um, thrown a wrench into how, what a normal normal day is like. What was it like managing this uh, institution during COVID? We have, the National Archives is uh, 40 facilities spread out across the country, a staff of almost 3,000 people. So it, it, it varied depending upon where you were in the country in terms of the COVID situation. So a small team of my senior staff met three times a week to monitor um, the, the, the pandemic in each of the institutions so we can make decisions about whether we're open or closed, whether we could bring staff in to ensure that uh, for security reasons, um, buildings were being monitored, those kinds of things, but also focused on now that everyone is at home, they're dealing with personal issues around isolation and uh, not being on the job and worried about family and um, job security things like that, so trying to figure out how, how can we address those issues. And then also, how can we provide a level of service to our customers, our, our researchers, and our, especially our veterans uh, during this pandemic? You uh, made digitizing the archives, I think early on you described it as the, your moonshot for the period that you were here. So first of all, how far along are you on that? We've made tremendous progress, but when you start with more than 15 billion pieces of paper and 40 mil, 43 million photographs, it's a, it's a huge... So, so while we have done a whole lot, there's still much more, much more to, to accomplish. Well, but could- what, we, what we learned during the pandemic is that that strategy was right on target because we were able to prov- connect people with the information they need for a lot of their research because of the digitization that we've done. Yeah, you anticipated my question because you couldn't have foreseen a pandemic and yet people were still able to access much of what they needed. Exactly, exactly. So what did you learn about user experience and connectivity needs by uh, the great uh, use of it? It, that's, That's a very good question because there's still in this country a digital divide. There are the haves and have nots, you know, people who are still tied to traditional ways of communicating by telephone or or snail mail, uh, as opposed to having access to robust internet uh, access. 
So we were still providing um, information on both in both streams. So other than our nation's founding documents, what do people most want from the National Archives? Genealogy is still, I think um, Alex Haley did a tremendous job in, in making uh, family history research popular. And to this day, that is still our number one user in our, in our, um, in our facilities, all of our facilities actually, whether it's ch- tracing military unit histories to see where a particular ancestor may have served and what it was like what, what kind of battles that person um, dealt with, or um, Civil War genealogy, or African-American genealogy. And of course, we just released the 1950 census. Census is a huge source of information for, um, for family history building. What is the concept behind holding it for 70 years? 72 years. 72 years, thank you. <laughs> It has to do with the way the law was written at a time when that was life expectancy. So it's a privacy issue, basically, to protect the privacy of the individuals. And and the assumption is that after 72 years, most of those people are dead anyway. And I'm sitting here at 76 years old, <laughs> pleased to know that um, I am have access to you know my first census, 1950, but also I'm using that as fodder for revision of that law to um, to maybe by the 19, when the 1960 census is released that it can be up to 100 years. So you think it should be extended yeah, okay. for privacy purposes. Yeah. So uh, I, I read some news stories that you did find some of your own family records. Did you learn did. anything new about your family? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Just corroborated. I, I corroborated, yeah, that we were at 15 Walnut Avenue and I did have three siblings, yes. You did have three siblings. So uh, along the way, um, a number of laws and directive change that impacted the business that you that you Mm -hmm. do here and the responsibilities you have. One of those was in 2009. uh, President Obama had issued a directive to establish the National Declassification Center. So uh, how large was that bank of data and what does what's the responsibility now? So the first tranche was 400 million pages of classified material going back to World War I. And with a deadline of December 31st, 2000, I forget, a December 31st deadline, it gave us three years anyway to accomplish that. And that review has accomplished, and more than 85% of it has been released to the public. It's important to know, note that the the way the law is written that it gives me the opportunity to bring together the original classifiers to review their work it does not give me the authority or the national archives the authority to declassify alone mm-hmm. so so it's a process it's a a process of of engaging the um the original agency classifiers in this review so for people who have uh uh, applied for a Freedom of Information mm-hmm. Act, a FOIA, as we call it here in Washington, and um, are frustrated by the amount of time that it takes to get the documents declassified. What's the cause of that? Um, staffing shortages, the number of people that we have devoted to it. The law, as most of the laws that are written, don't didn't come with funding um, for adding additional staff. Um, and depending upon what agencies did the original classification, their responsiveness. There is within the National Archives a unit called the um, OGIS, the the Office of Government Information Services, which serves as the FOIA ombudsman for the American public, so that individuals who are having trouble getting their FOIA request processed, responded to, can work with my staff to intercede on their behalf to speed up the process. If you were to advocate for a change in that law or process, what would it be? Um, It would be, if uh, in the ideal world, it would be to give me more authority, give the National Archives more authority to release. And you've mentioned staffing. Um, Over the dozen years you've been here, you always put in your request to Congress. Uh, I mean, from what I've been looking at, there's not been a great big increase in funding for the National Archives, even though the number of records that you're keeping has risen exponentially. It is an issue. It is. 
And right. so and now that you're going to be off the job, what's the message you want to tell Congress about what's needed here? That they need to pay attention to staffing levels across the executive branch. It's not just the National Archives, but FOIA is a good example. Every agency in the executive branch has a, a massive FOIA backlog, and it's because there aren't enough people dealing with the um, processing, coupled with the fact that the information technology infrastructure in the federal government is not what it should be. What's the impact on society of that? Um, they're prevented from holding their government accountable uh, because they can't have ready access to the records that they need. Along with the digital transformation came social media, and you've been a big advocate for the use of social media. One of the things you instituted was citizen archivists. Tell me about that project and what it's done for the archives. So when I became the archivist, and in in, I was sold on the idea of taking the job because of the Obama administration's open government initiative. And on his second day in office, or maybe it was for his first day, he met with his senior staff and, and told them that the government doesn't have all the answers and we need to figure out ways to involve, involve the American public in solving our problems. And I took that to heart in thinking about how we can involve the American public in helping us do our work in processing records. So a good example of that is that we have a large portion of our records in cursive. Cursive isn't being taught in schools anymore. So we have, as part of our citizen archivist dashboard, an opportunity for people to help us transcribe records. So we've loaded thousands and thousands of cursive records, and people across the world, actually, are transcribing those records for us. So kids now can actually read our records. That, that's and one example. What kind of people get involved in this? Um, nursing home groups, um, school groups, uh, individuals, a lot of former archives, uh, archives employees, um, people from all walks of life. Are, Do you ever get a chance to communicate with them? Yes. We... Um, we um, we keep track of our heavy users, so we um, have some conversations about what they're finding, and they send emails to me often about how excited they are to be working on th this project. It sounds uh, much like the model for Wikipedia. Yes. And you've also... <clears throat> been all in on Wikipedia. And as you well know, uh, that there are a number of historians who are very skeptical about it because of the crowdsourcing aspects of it. Why have you embraced it? I, um, I'm convinced I was um, very influenced by a book whose, name, whose author I can't remember, but uh, Wisdom of the Crowd. And it um, basically calls out the fact that... Um, there are many experts out there who have something to contribute to um, our, our knowledge of, of specific fields. And that Wikipedia is an opportunity for people to participate in that way. It's a self-editing kind of um, process that works mostly. And I um, also learned early on in social media that you can build a digital archive, but don't expect people to come to it. You need to be where the people are. So figure out where the people are. If you were looking for a photograph, you wouldn't ordinarily come to the National Archives. You would go to a website that specialized in photography, for instance. Wikipedia has become the encyclopedia of the Internet, and we have um, thousands and thousands of our records ta tagged in Wikipedia, and people are using them to do their research. More than 3 billion a year. 3 billion hits a year, as opposed to about 750,000 on our catalog. What about images? The same, exactly. Uh, in, in Wikimedia, all of our all the images that we have digitized have been scooped up in, our, in Wikimedia. You also created a Wikipedian in residence here at the archives. What does that position do? It was the first Wikipedian in the federal government, and it was um, 
it was twofold. One was to educate our staff about what Wikipedia was all about and get them excited and interested in contributing to Wikipedia. And the other was to increase the number of eyes on our content. So figuring out ways that we can get more and more of our content in front of people through through Wikipedia. And this is this is a, a powerful a message that I learned when I was at the New York Public Library when Wikipedia was was relatively young. Um, I was I was really interested in ensuring that as artic- as collections at the New York Public Library were being processed, that they were linked to the entries in Wikipedia. So so people could naturally go from Wikipedia to the New York Public Library to get more information. So the Library for the Performing Arts at New York Public had just finished the curator, one of the curators there had just finished processing the Patty Chayefsky collection and linked to, and went into the, into Wikipedia to the entry, which was done by, I believe, a Northwestern faculty member, um, and corrected um, some of the information in the post. This is the editing process. And that faculty member was outraged, absolutely outraged, and sent this flaming email to my bibliographer. And, you know, we had the information. We had the Chayefsky records. We had the correct information. So there was, a, um, for me, a great learning experience in terms of the power of Wikipedia in connecting people with the accurate information. So as we're speaking, there's a big controversy about Twitter. Uh, do you have an opinion about Twitter and free speech? Um, I do. I'm not a huge fan of Twitter. You know, I used to be, you know, an active participant, but the the level of civility in Twitter has just tanked. It's not, I don't find it useful anymore. Is there an, an agency yourself or Library of, Con- of Congress, for example, that is keeping all of the records, the tweets, social media posts of the federal agencies and then the executive branch? The, um, the Library of Congress has an agreement with Twitter to archive all, of, all, all tweets, not just government tweets. And we have an arrangement with um, them to do presidential tweets. So we have, and, and President Obama was the first um, president to tweet, and so that's where we learned and, and developed this agreement with Twitter to capture those. So we've had um, great concern during the Trump administration about deleted tweets, and, and, and Twitter has been, had been during that administration capturing both the original tweets and the deleted tweets. So as we're talking, it's just apparent there's just so much more information, so mm-hmm. much more data. Uh, how, do, how is it determined what is a, a, an appropriate government record to maintain? And can there be such a thing as too much to make it really impossible to access effectively? We've, um, we've developed guidelines um, for the agencies to, about archiving social media and pretty sp- specific about the uses of social media to share policy, business kinds of operations um, are considered record and need to be kept. Do you have an on-staff on person or a liaison with each one of the agencies to make sure that they are following all the, not just for social media, but yeah. all of the rules? We have, in, within the National Archives, there's a unit called the Ag- Agency Services, and they are the people who work closely with the records officers in each of the executive branch agencies. So there's the process of developing record schedules. They work closely with my staff to, to determine what kinds of records are being created, what formats are being created, what, how long they're retained in the agency, how much um, of them are of legal or historic value that need to be kept forever. And those are the records that get transferred to the National Archives. And that, pro- that transfer process is negotiated between the records, a- the records management unit in the agency and my staff in agency services. What about security issues? How have they changed since you've been on the job? Some are the same, and some have just gotten scarier. Um, so physical security is, has always been a problem. You know, the, the Sandy Berger theft of um, presidential records, Clinton records, and other kinds of high-profile 
um, in internal theft problems of film curator who stole for years, stole um, original films from the collection. Those kinds of security things have, have continued to be on my radar screen. So I'm the first archivist who insisted on exit screening of um, staff and visitors um, because so to ensure that people aren't walking out of here with with material. We also have a robust holdings protection unit within our security division here, as well as a similar unit within our inspector general office. And those folks are uh, responsible for the holdings, holdings protection folks working in each of our 40 facilities to ensure that the processes are um, up to date in terms of screening and protection of the collection and also um, screening um, trade shows, eBay, and places where documents are being sold for things that may have gotten away from us. Is, um, is this one of the things on the list of what keeps an archivist up at night? Yes, but bigger than that is cybersecurity and the threat to electronic information. Uh, that's a, for me, that is more worrisome than the physical the physical um, issues. And that is because it is so transient, potentially transient, and so um, targetable, I guess, um, that ensuring that what we have is protected, can't be deleted, can't be altered, is backed up. Um, Those are the kinds of cybersecurity issues that all of us in this business worry about, not just the government, but any of us who are in the, in the position of, of capturing and preserving electronic records. During your tenure, three new presidential libraries came online. Is that right? The Obama, Bush, and Trump libraries up to 15 now. Could you explain what the archives responsibility is for people that have visited them vis-a-vis sure. the museum versus what you do? Sure. So up until the um, Obama library, so let me talk about the Herbert Hoover up through Bush 43. The, um, the pattern has been a private foundation um, is, is, is established by the president, usually uh, at the beginning of the second term, if it's a two-term president. And they start raising money to build a facility, which is a library and a museum with... Um, using the National Archives specifications for security and environmental conditions uh, in the library and the museum. And then um, um, the uh, and, and the mo- more modern libraries um, or units also have a policy center, so the Bush Center, for instance. Uh, and then at, when the library is dedicated, it becomes a federal facility um, with funding from a percentage of funding coming from the foundation to fund both the museum and the and the library. So it is a, a NARA facility, National Archives and Records Administration facility, up through Bush 43. Starting with the Obama Library, it is a it will be our first all digital presidential library. And what is being built in Chicago is a presidential center. So it will be a combined museum and policy center run by the foundation with an agreement, uh, an MOU with the National Archives about loan of artifacts from the National Archives to the museum. It turns out that um, 95, 90 to 95% of the records created in the Obama administration were born digital. There's no paper equivalent. So the money that was being used, that would have been used to build a library is being used to digitize the uh, small percentage of records that are in paper so that we can, uh, on day one, flip the switch for access to the Obama records online. You don't have to come to a physical facility. It will be open 24 hours, seven days a week. It's the new model for presidential libraries. And what is the rule about a public access to presidential library records? Five years lock on the new president, and then a certain portion of them, um, there's a rolling schedule for a release of records. 
So for people that may not have been familiar with your name before over the past year, they've probably got familiar with it because of the legal wrangling with the Trump administration over access to its records. Um, How much can you say about that at this point? Um, I can say that there is an investigation going on. Um, I can say that um, we know that we we suspect that we don't have everything. We're still um, trying to figure out what what we don't have. Um, And that it points out to me the weakness of the Presidential Records Act, um, which gives me the authority to provide guidance to the White House, but it doesn't give me any authority over um, activities in the in the White House, as I do have in the Federal Records Act. It, are you surprised? I mean, I, I guess for context for people listening to this, is this the first time then in your tenure that you've ever been in a legal dispute with the presidential administration over access to records? This is the first time for me. And I believe it's the first time for, in a long time, for the the agency, probably going back to Richard Nixon. um, And that whole situation was responsible for the creation of the Presidential Records Act to establish the fact that those records are government property and not personal property. Do you think there's any appetite for changing the rules around this? It's hard for me to predict what the appetite is in the city today. Let me switch gears and talk about budget in a, from a different direction. Mm-hmm. You mentioned the, um, the private donations, and uh, the National Archives Foundation has been your partner in, um, in some ways making up the budget shortfall that you have. Uh, can you talk a, a bit about, first of all, philosophically, um, are we the only country and Western democracy that looks to outside funders to help with the record keeping? We have um, set a tone for other countries. <laughs> so the British Library, for instance, British Archives has a friends group. So it's a it's a model that has been adopted by other other countries. So they see it as an opportunity. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Uh, in fact, in fact, they're in this country raising money for the for the British Archives. <laughs> Well, that's the nation of immigrants. There's probably. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, how does how does it work between you, your office, and the foundation? What they get involved in, and where where the lines drawn, that sort of thing. So they're responsible for supporting our education and exhibition program. Uh, they don't get into the the record keeping activities or or any of that can that kind of information. So where we have been very successful with them is around civic civic literacy which is one of their um, primary uh, targets, and um, and exhibit space renovation. We're now in the process of planning a renovation of the public vaults in this building. We we were very successful to uh, interest David Rubenstein in creating a records of rights uh, gallery downstairs around uh, the Magna Carta as as um, the centerpiece. And we're doing a similar kind of uh, rethink of the public vaults which surround the rotunda. So they've been um, fundraising uh, for that. They, um, the partnership um, in, involves collaboration on exhibit themes and public programming also. When did the, uh, the founding documents exhibit reopen to the public? It, on and off, we were, because of the spikes in the pandemic, it was open for a couple of weeks in, I want to say, December. Um, and most recently in March, we came back to um, normal. What was it like for you? You spend a lot of time in this building to see people coming back in, standing in line to see those documents. It was great. It was it was heartwarming um, that that we were back, that people felt comfortable. That um, I always, in my time here, have always tried to carve out some time during the day to wander over to the rotunda to see who's there, what kind of experience they're having, and I'm I'm always impressed with, especially family groups with probably a grandparent who's explaining to their grandchildren 
the importance of, of the documents. And it was so nice to see that happening again. One of the other things that related to that, you instituted a July 4th reading of the Constitution on the steps of the archives. Again, a hiatus during COVID. I've heard you talk about what that means to you. Why was it important, do you think, to to do that? And what kinds of people come to that event? It, it, it just amazed me that um, that this is a, something that that attracts so many people, that the opportunity to hear the Declaration of Independence sp- spoken um, the way it was when they when it was first issued in public in town meetings and and town criers, you know, telling people what the Declaration says, and the exact words that the especially the charges against the king, no one ever reads that part of the Declaration of Independence, and to hear it by reenactors, outrage speaking, and to hear the crowd booing and hissing King George, that is such a powerful, till, still, after so many years, still such a powerful message about our freedom and our democracy. I said the uh, Constitution, and I misspoke as the Declaration. It's okay. But while we're talking about the Constitution, one of the other controversies you found yourself involved in is the Equal Rights Amendment. I can't tell you enough about that. You can't tell me enough about it. <laughs> we have a we have a um, uh, a legal situation that you know I can't say a whole lot. I can tell you that it kills me that um, we're in this situation. I can tell you that Ruth Bader Ginsburg twice told me in this building we need to start over. So this is going to be uh, not understandable to people. The issue. What's the issue involved in it? that? The time limit has expired, that 38 states may have ratified, but the time limit has expired, so that's a constitutional question. And more seriously, five states have rescinded their votes. Is that legal? That's another constitutional issue. Why does this fall in your lap? Because the National Archives um, certifies the amendment process, reports when all of the votes are, are in going to switch gears again and go back to exhibits and get you out of the legal <laughs> controversies. <laughs> uh, you are a, a Vietnam veteran, and one of the special projects that you did during your term was a major exhibit called Remembering Vietnam. Why did you feel it was important for this uh, story to be told so many years after the war? Um, we were coming up on the 50th anniversary of the war, and um, we have such important material that had been recently declassified. Um, and I had just read um, a terrific book about from by a Vietnamese person whose family survived Vietnam at the period where he made the comment that the war was fought twice, once in life, in reality, and once in memory. And the farther we get away from it, the less we remember about it. And I wanted to make sure that those, that that's, those memories, those, those truths were captured and told in, in a way that will live longer than just the exhibit itself. So it was important to have voices from both sides, from um, Americans and Vietnamese, um, telling the story. So the, the video segments of the uh, exhibit are, re- are really very powerful. Did working on that change the way you process the war? Uh, I think so. First of all, it was a very controversial exhibit. Controversial to funders, controversial to my staff. Um, And I'm very proud of the fact that we were able to create something that was universally celebrated, that um, we had done it correctly. Um, I gained a deeper appreciation for just how um, how negligent our government was in communicating the truth to the American public. I had a sense of that. I was there. You know, all of my information came through Stars and Stripes. The government rag you know, told you what was going on. But I was getting the real information from people who would send me Time Magazine or, or something like that. So to be able to demonstrate 
um, just how fractured the communication was with the American public was um, very important. Earlier in the conversation, you referenced veterans accessing their records through the National Archives. What is your responsibility for military records, and what have you done to improve the process for families and veterans? So we um, have all the military records. I know I've ever served in the military records in a facility in uh, St. Louis, and most of those records are in paper form and have not been digitized. And for veterans to get um, education, medical benefits, housing benefits, and for families to get burial benefits, they need to provide uh, what's called the DD-214, a separation document that proves that the, um, the individual actually did serve. And so production of um, DD-214s is, is a huge service in, in, um, from St. Louis. We're working very closely with the VA to digitize the paper records so there will come a point where we'll be able to deliver those um, electronically. Um, We're not there yet. Are you happy with the waiting time for veterans and their families? No, not at all. Not at all. We've we've poured um, more and more staff into the into the process. The COVID the COVID situation limited us to emergency requests, so medical and burial. Um, we're, we're top. If you are on the National Archives website, there is this sentence, the National Archives latest strategic plan is dedicated to advancing equity and improving service delivery by connecting with and providing access to underserved and underrepresented communities. What does that mean in practice? We have gone through a, um, because of the George, George Floyd situation and the uh, turmoil uh, within the country and within my staff across the country, um, I launched a task force on racism that took a look at internally and externally, internally how we recruit, retain, um, promote um, a diverse workforce, externally how we present ourselves in our material in education programs, and how our descriptions in our catalog accurately describe the communities who created the the information and all of all of the work that is going on now is around ensuring that that the um, repair is a reparative description working group which is looking at how over the years we have interpreted put our own stamp mostly white male describers have put our own stamp on our records. And now we're in the process of engaging the communities as we've identified them, Native American communities, African American communities, Latino communities, and helping us repair those descriptions. We're not changing records, and there's been a lot of bad press about us altering records. What we're doing is trying to accurately describe how the records were created and what language should be used to describe them. There was a bit of a fuss on the internet and social media about disclaimers being put on the founding documents. And they weren't put on the documents themselves. They were put on the website to educate people that not everything in here, uh, that some of the descriptions are offensive. There was not uh, targeting the charters. In um, 2019, President Trump signed into law something called the Civil Rights Cold Case Records Collection yes. Act. Tell yes. me about that. It's just been launched. The, the, the panel is now in place to take a look at long, uh, undealt with cold cases. Um, we have a, a panel that was appointed by uh, presidential appointments, uh, Senate appointments, and House appointments, and we are the administrator of the the work. What is an example of a cold case? What is it dealing with? Um, that's a good question. I don't. I don't have the list of cold cases. Is it that, murders, for example? A lynching? Uh, could be. Things yes. Like that. Could be. Yes. 
And uh, why? I imagine you see this as a positive thing for the country and for definitely, the archives. Definitely, definitely. It's just taken so long to get this off the ground that... Because of COVID? Yes. Uh, While we're talking about the George Floyd murder, um, what it has also started in the country is this whole reconsideration of what we memorialize, um, the statues, the naming conventions around the country. As someone whose entire life has been devoted to preserving things, what do you think about that? I have have really mixed feelings about it. Um, This is a part of our history. Um, there, There has to be some way to to incorporate the what was going on in the country at the time rather than just destroying. You know, it feels to me like we're losing a piece of our history when we just tear things down and don't do a good job of providing an opportunity for context. So uh, another approach would be add more context to what exists? Right. Uh, Related to this, you've also said publicly a few times, especially in the last months, that you hope that your successor will not be, as all the previous archivists have been, a white male. Why is that important? I I think it it points to a lack of attention to diversity in appointments. Um, For Since 1934, you can't tell me that there wasn't a qualified um, minority or woman to fill this position. Um, and it's just been always a, a white male. And I felt strongly, um, and I've gotten a lot of blowback because I said this, that um, they should be looking um, at a more diverse pool. You are also the first librarian to hold the job. Can you believe it? <laughs> I guess I guess not. Um, why, why is that um, how has that changed how you've approached the job? The reason I reacted was because when my nomination was um, announced, there was a woman on, on a history list serve named Harriet, I'm still looking for her, who said he's only a librarian. <laughs> so that's why I reacted. I think um, because of my background in public service in thinking about the connection of pe- people with the information they need, um, has given me a certain perspective about the services we provide here and using what we call user-centered approach to crafting our services comes from my in public service experience. Uh, what are the other things that you think, considering the digitization process and how you see that going forward, what are the other challenges and qualifications that someone would be ideally suited to take this job after you? I think um, a knowledge of, I, while I had to develop this myself, it would be, it would be nice if the person came in with a, a knowledge and appreciation for how the um, Hill works, what the role of Congress is, um, the, the whole interaction, separation of, of um, White House versus um, the Hill in terms of the funding uh, operation, those kinds of issues. I, would, I think would be helpful. And technology background is is a given. It has to be someone who knows, who has experience in exploiting technology in the information business. So is it a different set of qualifications than you had 12 and a half years ago? Um, I, would, I would say, yeah. Yeah, definitely. And where, um, if you were to offer that person advice about getting started, what would it be? Take some time to um, understand where we're, where the agency is coming from, um, where what we have projected for the future. Get to know the staff. Uh, it's an incredibly strong and knowledgeable staff. Um, I would caution them about bringing in a posse. Um, get to know who you're working with first before you start thinking you need to bring people in. Um, in all of my transitions from from MIT to Duke, from Duke to the New York Public, and from the New York Public to the National Archives, I've always spent at least the first six months getting to know the staff, identifying talent, um, especially talent that hasn't had an ability, an opportunity to contribute in a meaningful way, and to provide opportunities for them before um, before looking outside for, for help. So would you just uh, outline the uh, tenure situation? So it's a presidential appointment. You'll have to go through confirmation process. So how long can an archivist stay in the position? Life. 
it's a it's a lifetime appointment. Should that change? I um, <laughs> the Library of Congress um, law was recently changed to ten years, and I think ten years is a um, it would be fine. Yeah, I'm really concerned about, and one of the reasons that you know twelve years is it for me, of overstaying your welcome. You know, it's time for someone someone new. You and I uh, were talking before we started taping that I actually went back and watched your confirmation hearing uh, almost 13 years ago. Uh, it was pretty benign, I'd have to say. Are you anticipating that confirmation hearings in the way Washington has changed for the, your successor will be um, a smoother process? I can't imagine a smooth process for any uh, confirmation hearing these days. I, I'm sure that there there will be uh, concerns raised about things that you that we've been talking about about the um, reparative description work that's going on about ERA uh, service to veterans um, I'm I'm sure that they're going to be it's going to be a more contentious certainly more contentious uh, hearing than than I experienced and answering for policies that you've put in place exactly. without without being here exactly. Um, it, it, I guess you were you surprised that your job has become controversial? Um, surprised, yes. Uh, surprised and pleased, actually. Why is that? The um, January sixth commission um, demand for records has focused new attention to the records of the country in a way that most Americans never thought of the importance of records to our democracy. And I think that's positive. So uh, the a few we talked about a couple of the controversies. One of the other ones that that you've been involved in is the JFK assassination records, which will never end. <laughs> you're sighing as you're saying that. I am. Why will it never end? <laughs> Some. Um, it's getting better, and we're going to we're about to make an announcement on just how better it's gotten. But we're still dealing with. Um, some agencies that won't relinquish information because of concerns about PII, personal and identifiable information. But we're getting much closer. So how much is left? So if you, you have I'm, a full... I'm, I'm waiting to hear that. I asked that question this morning. Tell me, I want the figure. They, they only have hours to let, to let you know. <laughs> exactly. Here. So exactly. what do you hope, I'm mean, going back to the side that you have with the, about this being endless, what do you hope a full public access to the JFK records will reveal or do for it all will the put the, It will put the, the conspiracy to rest that people will see that there, 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 is, no, there is no there there. That's what I'm hoping will happen. One other uh, controversy I wanted to ask you about uh, it was the women's suffrage photo. Oh, my God. I'm bringing yes. out all the hits. I can yeah, I know. It, that was a huge mistake on our part, um, a, a hard lesson learned. Um, so would we, you explain what happened? Yes. Um, we, we altered a photograph um, from uh, Washington Post. Was it a Washington I forget who the... I'm, for the hundredth, the centennial. This is a centennial of the um, women, the, wrote, the right to vote for women. Our um, rightfully hers exhibit opening outside the exhibit gallery, a very clever lenticular display. As you walk by it, you see the, the 1919 protest march. And as you walk by again, you'll see the women's march. And in the women's march, Two of the posters that are being held are blurred, and that was done deliberately with Getty Images working for us um, to uh, block out objectionable language, objectionable language, as, as determined by the National Archives. Huge mistake. So you said lessons learned. What was the lesson learned? That we never do that again and that all use of any, any um, photograph, th this, m most of our exhibits are our own content, National Archives content. Any outside material that we use 
get scrutiny and um, sign off that ensures that that doesn't that never happens again. We have about five, six minutes left in our time with you. So I've, I've walked you through a couple of the tough times. Can you point to a single week or a single day on this job that was the pinnacle, the best thing that's happened to you in your time here? Oh, uh, I, um, I would certainly point to our naturalization ceremonies. We do two a year on Constitution Day and Bill of Rights Day. And it is so moving to have 75 or 100 new citizens sworn in in the rotunda in the presence of the charters where their rights and responsibilities are spelled out as they were originally written. A ceremony overseen by um, a, a federal judge and a, a speaker. And we always try and recruit someone who's a naturalized citizen. So we've had Jose Andres, Madeleine Albright, um, Elaine Chow as, as speakers, and they, each one of them tells a you know, moving story about their own experience becoming an American citizen. So you are about to say goodbye to this building after uh, 12 and a half years. You've talked reverentially about this building. What does it mean to you or for the country? It is, you know, it's a symbol of our democracy. Um, to have the founding documents on permanent display is a unique situation. You don't find that in other countries. We are the envy. I'm the envy of my peers around the country because we have this opportunity to celebrate our democracy this way. So you can come in on the Constitution side and, and visit, visit the charters, and you can come in on the Pennsylvania Avenue side and do your own research and explore, explore our history through, through the records. In our earlier interviews with you, you've, you've told us about the path into your career as a librarian. Uh, but if we were to visit your office today, you've got three framed letters from three different presidents uh, unearthed in the collections here. Can you tell me about what those letters say to you about the young David Ferriero <laughs> and the path your life took? I obviously didn't have a life as a kid. I was writing, too busy writing pre- letters to the president. It told me I had an early interest in our history. I remember the first letter was written as a result of a, an assignment in the sixth grade. President Eisenhower was going to India, and I had to write a report about it. And I can remember it was the first time I ever read the New York Times. My father would bring it home at night, and I would read it about the president in, in that for my, for my um, report. And that triggered the first letter to the president. Um, asking for a photograph suitable for framing in my first letter. Um, and then I was, I was tremendously um, impressed by JFK growing up in Beverly, Massachusetts. You know, he was a Massachusetts native. And, and then when he announced the Peace Corps, I got interested in that and asked, wrote asking about that. And then when LBJ signed the Civil Rights Act, um, that, was, that was meaningful to me, and I wrote, congratulating him for signing the Civil Rights Act. It was a complete surprise to me when the directors of those libraries presented those letters because I had forgotten. Forgot that you wrote them. Forgot Mm -hmm. I wrote them. So uh, I looked in uh, C-SPAN's archives uh, before we talked and discovered that this is the 148th citation of you in the C-SPAN video (laughs) archive. So thank you for that. And I'm I'm wondering, um, overall, one of those was in 2016 when we got together with the head of the Smithsonian and uh, the head of the Library of Congress. At the time, you told us that you three had never talked before. Uh, Anything come out of that discussion? You all said that it was something you'd like to continue, did you? We we talk on a regular basis, and especially during COVID, sharing information about um, uh, coordinating information about opening and reopening, uh, masking guidelines, dealing with uh, the, the COVID situation. Um, and um, we have joint activities going on on the preservation front, our preservation folks working together, sharing information about um, the various formats that are in our collections. It's an ongoing conversation. So last question is the almost obvious one since this is last day. What are you going to miss the most? I think it's the, um, the staff that I work with. Um, I am fortunate to have some um, really smart, clever, 
passionate folks about the mission of the of the agency, and they have been just terrific to work with. What does retirement look like for you? It's um, you know it's a blank page at this point. I've made no commitments. Um, people keep asking, "What are you going to do?" And it's um, whatever I want to do. It's making it up as we go along, and um, we'll see. We'll see. Well, thank you for making a time with C-SPAN one of your very last things in your job officially and for all of the time you and your staff have given us over the years you've been in office. C-SPAN has been very important to me over the 12 years that I've been here. This is my main source of information. It's on in my office all the time for hearings and, and just news in general. So thank you for the work that you do. Thanks. But thanks for your time. Thank you. Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Q&A and subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts so you'll never miss an episode. And while you're there, please take a minute to rate and review us. You can also send us an email about Q&A at podcasts at c-span.org. Send me your questions, your comments or ideas. Your feedback is welcome.